Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is part of the new LAS Group Buying Program, which was launched in August of this year. It's a group purchasing program that uh, covers most of Canada and that helps Ontario municipalities access an even uh, greater discount on the things that they're buying all the time than, um, than what we'd be able to get on our own. As part of it, we have this fleet management program by Enterprise, and I'm joined by a couple of uh, folks from their team to uh, explain to you how it works. Uh, we've a couple of housekeeping notes. We're going to do question and answer using the Q&A tool uh, that's built into the Zoom platform. So right at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A box. If you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in as they, pop, as they uh, come in and then we'll answer them towards the, uh, the end of the presentation today. Uh, Dave, if you can hop to the next slide, we've got a couple of other webinars coming up as part of this program to let you know about. Uh, first one is Staples Business Advantage. That one's taking place next week, uh, December 11th at 10. And in January, we're, we'll be showing the Gas Boy Fuel Management Program. Uh, we will be recording this program and we'll be posting it on YouTube after uh, the webinar is done. If you need a link for that, uh, we'll send it out to all the participants after the webinar is done. Uh, so with all that taken care of, I'll introduce David Trott, who's the Area Sales Manager for Eastern Canada, and Alex Ribby, who's the Director of Fleet Management in Eastern Canada. Thank you all very much. This is this is Alex and David sitting here with me. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today about uh, what it is that we do and why we do what we do, uh, and appreciate our partnership with uh, with you all as well. Uh, so I'm the director of our operation in Toronto, and we service most of Eastern Canada. Uh, and just a little background on Enterprise. Maybe maybe people have heard of Enterprise rent a car, which is our most prevalent brand. Uh, but our fleet management division works with entities that own and operate their own vehicles to help them do it for less. And overall, Enterprise is one of the largest operators of one of the largest privately held operators of vehicles in the world with uh, just over 2 million vehicles. And if you rewound about a decade ago when the US was going through some pretty difficult financial times, uh, we had a lot of public entities that were coming to us and asking us for help in how we're effectively running a fleet when costs were going up, but revenues were going down. And so we engaged in a lot of conversations with a variety of different entities and learned a little bit about some of the key intricacies of uh, our government clients, how they look at budgeting, how they look at operating vehicles uh, to gain a better understanding. And we were able to develop a program that's been a big benefit to a lot of them uh, over the years. And what we were seeing is pretty much the same story across the board. It was uh, revenues were going up through tax revenue or, or uh, different ways that entities are raising money, but expenses were going up faster. And when that was happening, it caused capital budgets to become constrained. And when people were doing their budgeting process, Vehicle replacement is one of the things that's on the list. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, if an entity needed to do things like replace a road or build a new school or upgrade a facility, or they could replace a pickup truck, it made all the sense in the world to not replace the pickup truck and put it back in these bigger capital projects. And as a result, over time, uh, their vehicle fleet was aging, and while they weren't spending a lot of capital replacing vehicles, their operating expenses were skyrocketing. And furthermore, their vehicles were getting older and older and older, a little bit un more unsafe, a little bit more unreliable, uh, and we were able to help create a bridge funding mechanism and a platform that allows entities to accomplish kind of the best of both worlds, which is reducing overall costs, putting a better plan in place, and ultimately having a, uh, a much better handle on their capital and operating budgets as it, as it pertains to the fleet. And most of the entities that we're talking to, uh, the fleet is not their primary core function, but it's a necessity in order to be able to do what they do. At Enterprise, 
fleet is 100% of our core function, whether that be operating our own vehicles or helping our clients operate theirs. We'll send this out, I believe, uh, afterwards, just so everybody's got a recap. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into fleet management. And really it's everything from the acquisition process to how they choose to fund vehicles, to how they're compliant, uh, to how they operate, to how they resell. And there's a lot of transactions there. In the US over the last few years, the government platform has been our largest growing segment of our business. Uh, and from a fleet management perspective, we're currently the second largest uh, fleet management company in North America, excluding our own rental vehicles that we own and operate ourselves. Uh, but we're quickly closing in on being the largest fleet management company. So when I say that it's our fastest growing part of our company, uh, it's significant. And the reason that it's the fastest growing part of our company is because we're able to help simplify this process for our municipal clients uh, and put a better plan in place. So we started working in Canada, in Western Canada, in Alberta, about a year or so ago with uh, political entities. And this is a list of just some of the current government references, people that have started partnerships with us over the last 12 months. We've operated here in Ontario for about a decade now, but our government side of our business has just opened. The reason I'm telling you that we've operated in Ontario is because we already have the infrastructure in place here in Ontario to service uh, Ontario-based clients or Eastern Canadian-based uh, clients. So I'm gonna go ahead and take over there. Sorry guys, this is Dave. My name is David Trott. I'm the area sales manager for Enterprise Fleet Management. And what I'm gonna talk you through here is some of the strategy um, behind you know, the programs we put in place for our partners and really how we leverage the infrastructure, the technology, the systems, and the tools that Enterprise uses for ourselves every single day to help our partners not only lower their costs, but also stay in newer vehicles. Um, and the first piece to that is really developing a solid acquisition strategy for vehicles. And some of the, the uh, key things we put in place for our partners when it comes to acquiring new vehicles, it, 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 it all starts with one, choosing the right vehicle for the application. And we're gonna show you a tool in just a second here um, to help us determine what the vehicle is uh, for each application that we're using. But more importantly, it, it's how do we get ahead of the curve and factory order these vehicles directly from the manufacturer. That's kind of step one to a good acquisition plan is going manufacturer direct. And what that allows us to do is avoid having to acquire vehicles um, off a dealer's lot. And to Alex's point earlier, I mean, the, the majority of the municipal, municipalities that we work with that are deferring replacements um, in favor of using that capital elsewhere, well, typically they're acquiring vehicles as vehicles age or as they die. So it's kind of a, a, a forcible retirement and they have to go out and kind of find a vehicle right away to replace it, which often they have to go directly to a dealer and see what's kind of available on the lot, which is not the most cost effective way to do it. By factory ordering vehicles, not only do we get to equip the vehicle with only the specs that you need, so you're not getting vehicles with maybe a trim level higher or some extra options that you didn't necessarily need on these work trucks or work vans, um, but it also allows us to avoid uh, dealer markups on vehicles or um, paying for the interest that a dealer has accrued by having that uh, sit on the lot or be in their inventory until you needed it. So step one is factory ordering the vehicles, specking them out exactly to your spec. Um, but, but the second piece of that is timing. And, and ordering the vehicle at the right time of year. And this is something that we talk a lot about with our customers, because if you actually look at the OEMs in particular, they typically have four to six price increases over a model year. Um, and the cheapest time to actually acquire a, a vehicle for the manufacturers is in the introductory model year pricing, which happens in September for the OEMs. So typically with our partners, you know, we're trying to uh, plan for all of our replacements and be as proactive as possible and identify for those replacements throughout the year, but ordering all those vehicles and leveraging that volume at the beginning of the model year. 
So order timing is key and, and, and it might not seem like a ton of money, but typically the difference between ordering a half ton work truck in September versus ordering it in July. And I'm just talking about, again, a little half ton work truck can be anywhere from 1200 to $2,000 in just uh, avoidance of those uh, factory price increases, which can be substantial. Um, so, so that's the first component in terms of acquiring vehicles the right way. We help our customers by not only determining the right vehicle, but handling all of the acquisition process for them. And that's from you know, placing that order into the order banks with the manufacturer right to delivery. And all that's handled by our team here. And obviously, you know, if, you're, if you're purchasing a lot of vehicles and you're providing you know, the acquisition services um, of acquiring them for our partners, well, we also have to have an impact of remarketing those vehicles and selling them for our partners as well. And if you think about enterprise as a whole, uh, we're the largest private buyer and private seller of vehicles in North America annually, um, which means we have a ton of skin in the game when it comes to selling vehicles the right way. And we take a lot into consideration when we're working with our partners in terms of determining how we're going to earn the highest yield from vehicles at the back end, just like we do when we're evaluating vehicles at the front end in terms of, of factory ordering them and ordering them from the right manufacturer. So what we take into consideration as we're acquiring vehicles is the make, the model, the trim level, the engine, the configuration, all the features on the vehicle, and not only what that's gonna cost when we purchase the vehicle, but what's gonna earn us the best resale uh, in you know, whether it's 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, when we go to the sell that vehicle. And uh, there's a ton of strategy that goes into that. I mean, when you're looking at, in particular in Ontario, I mean, seasonality comes into play, you know, when you're looking at the used car market. And if you just think about enterprises infrastructure for selling vehicles, we have 700 dedicated folks and all they do all day long is sell vehicles for ourselves and for our partners. And, and the benefit to um, our municipalities and government entities and working with us is they have access to those people to sell all of their vehicles uh, at, at the end of the vehicle's life. So by, by getting our, our partners out of the used car business, typically what we see with government entities is it avoids vehicles going to auction. Normally um, at the end of vehicles lives, I would say for the majority of our municipal partners, they're taking vehicles to auction. And, and we only sell about 15% of our vehicles at the auction right now. And the reason for that is by utilizing our resale network, we outperform Canadian Black Book by, you know, call it five to 10% year over year. I mean, last year you see we were 8.4% there versus the auction. And, and why that's important is, is that's your money at the end of the day. I mean, that, that's money that, that we earn for our partners and, and, and that's their uh, equity at the end of term. So it's really important to have a strategy, not only to buy the right vehicle, buy it the right way, but it's really important to have a strategy to sell that vehicle based on supply and demand in that marketplace. I can't tell you how many times that, that we have our partners who want to sell, you know, cargo vans in the dead of winter. And, you know, we tell them to hang on for an extra two to three months to sell that vehicle because we earn an extra 10 to 15% of that value. So there's a ton of strategy that comes into timing uh, to sell these vehicles as well as which swim lane we want to use to do it. We provide all of that expertise and service to our clients uh, moving forward. So, uh, I kind of spoke to a tool that we use to help uh, our customers determine the right vehicle for the application. And this is a, a, a tool that we use called total cost of ownership analysis or side-by-side -side cost analysis. And, and I'm not going to go through every line item uh, on this graph here, but more importantly, what this is doing is it's comparing different vehicles um, and it compares each facet of total cost of ownership. And, and, and eventually what it does is it actually just divides that um, over the annual mileage driven on those vehicles to give us an idea, everything all in, what is it costing to operate these vehicles on a per kilometer basis? So we take the acquisition cost of the vehicle, uh, we take the fuel cost over the term based on the mileage and the engine efficiency of each option. We look at the total depreciation, inclusive of what that vehicle is gonna sell for um, at the end of that vehicle's life. And then we look at the mileage pattern and we look at the maintenance costs. And when we look at all of that together, it gives us a good idea of what that vehicle is gonna cost. And we do all of this analysis for our partners uh, when we get to the point where we're forecasting you know, new vehicle replacements for the year, um, because enterprise, we're unbiased to which manufacturer you work with because we work with all of them. 
So at the end of the day, we're looking for the vehicle that's the lowest cost per kilometer, not just the low, lowest cost to acquire. And often what you'll see is that the lowest cost vehicle to acquire often isn't the cheapest vehicle to operate. Um, so all that that um, is done in-house by our people in order to provide this analysis to our customers. So in this particular circumstance, you know, look, at, I highlighted the cost per kilometer of these vehicles. And what you'll see is the, the, the 2019 Ram 1500 in this case came out with the lowest cost per kilometer. So what we did was, was we wanted to run that through a sample analysis that we'd show um, a potential uh, government entity or municipality that we'd work with um, to show you what some of the results may look like uh, based on some of the mechanisms and plans we could put in place. So the first thing that we looked at was, you know, from an acquisition standpoint, you know, just how good are government incentives and how, how fast can we get ahead of market value in terms of the depreciation component alone by, by working with, you know, RAM as a manufacturer with a government incentive. And you'll see that, the, that there's, there's a, an MSRP cost for this vehicle, there's an invoice cost for this vehicle, and that includes destination charge and total options of that vehicle. And you'll see uh, MSRP, call it just under 44,000, and then invoice cost of $40,296. Well, the concession on that vehicle is just, just about $18,000. And we're, we're actually acquiring that vehicle directly from the manufacturer for 25, just, just under 26,000 or 25,100, sorry. Um, but the interesting part about that is, is, is that's such an aggressive buy that curbs that initial depreciation hit or market loss uh, aggressively. And you'll see um, what I put below that was basically the Canadian Black Book results of selling that vehicle um, on year one of that, that delivering versus, you know, 2017 versus a 2014 versus a 2018. And the reason why I put that all together was to discuss the capital outlay to bring this vehicle into fleet. It's actually really interesting that, that when you purchase that vehicle out the door, you're in a $2,200 equity position, you know, based on the resale value of that vehicle in the market today being $27,300. And if we fast forward a year and we're looking at a 15,000 kilometer a year trend on these vehicles, at, at year two of that vehicle, you're still in an equity position of, you know, call it $400, um, and then as you progress further along, you'll see that, you know, by the end of the vehicle's life for most of our government partners, that vehicle being a 2008 model year, you know, that capital outlay goes from, you know, a positive of $2,200 on year one to $21,000 of capital outlay over, you know, call it 10 years of operating that vehicle in fleet. Yeah, what we tend to see uh, when we work with municipalities again is that, you know, everybody's got an idea of what they want to do from a replacement strategy. What we hear a lot are things like 10 years, 150,000-ish kilometers, kind of whatever comes first, but that's sort of the trigger point. And all we're trying to demonstrate is there's a better way to do it, a more efficient way to do it that's going to be more cost-effective. And we bring this type of information to our clients annually as they go through their budgeting process. And we work, obviously, based on how you budget today to get you the information that you need at the right time so that we can execute a strategy whenever the timing is best based on how you uh, go through your process today. But in this case, it's really a prime example of the municipality can, the, the most cost effective way for this particular vehicle to be run assuming that they're not putting a ton of aftermarket in, and we can help with that too. I'm not talking about strobe light units with uh, headache racks and truck bodies and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about pretty simple like landscaping vehicles, maintenance vehicles, which would be something more like what this is used for. A one to two year flip is much more cost effective and much safer than keeping a vehicle for 10 to 12 years. And because of the generally low kilometer patterns that our municipal entities uh, drive combined with the high concessions, there's just a better way to do it. Now, an interesting thing, a lot of people, uh, as we go through this process, start to wonder, well, I've got people that are uh, mechanics for me or that are in charge of this. Why can't we just do this ourselves? And the reality is, is that anybody can try and do this themselves, but it astronomically compounds the number of transactions that an entity has to deal with. And quite frankly, most of them aren't, aren't uh, set up to do that. 
You now have to acquire significantly more units. You've got to do side-by-side -side comparisons on everything. You've got to be able to surplus X number of units, whereas today, those numbers are much smaller. So by partnering with us, we're able to demonstrate how we can reduce overall costs, uh, make life easier, and, and Dave will go right into a way that we look at analyzing the data that you have today. Yeah, and that's a great segue into how we help um, because, because to Alex's point, is the right time, you know, is it 12 months? Is it 24 months? Well, the answer is it's kind of a moving target because there's lots of, of, of facets that you got to keep your fingers on the pulse of in order to make sure that you're firing on all cylinders to accomplish this plan. And, and one of them is the used car market. You know, that, that plays such a key indication or a key factor into this entire plan um, because sometimes, you know, we'll start on a, you know, a two-year hold with the customer and, and the used car market, which is really hot, we can look at, you know, a, a 15 or 18 month flip of those vehicles or even extending into a third year if it's the opposite of effects. There's a lot of, of, of ongoing analysis that we have to provide our customers with to keep this plan not only tailored to them, but to make sure that we're, you know, not only driving down the overall costs, but also keeping them brand new vehicles all the time. So this graph just kind of talks a little bit or, or speaks to the philosophy of, you know, if you look at the three buckets in terms of depreciation, maintenance, and fuel, you know, we find that most municipalities we work with are hyper-focused on that depreciation piece. And when it comes to analyzing maintenance and fuel, I mean, I mean, it's either completed in-house or it's something where it's outsourced, but it's not often looked at in terms of, of layering all the costs together. And what we know as enterprise is that, you know, eventually it comes to a point where the operating costs start to outweigh the depreciation. And if you look at the beginning of a vehicle's life and you drive a brand new vehicle off the lot, I mean, it's all depreciation. You lose, call it 20 to 30% of its value, depending on how you purchase the vehicle. Um, but at the end of its vehicle's life, I mean, it's not worth anything at 10 years. At 10 years worth a couple hundred dollars or scrap metal or it goes to the auction or, or whatever. And back to you know, the beginning of the vehicle's life, it's as efficient from a fuel standpoint as it ever will be. And I mean, the maintenance is just basic preventative maintenance. However, fast forward to the end of that vehicle's life. And I mean, you know, you've, you've lost some fuel economy over this being a work truck and being operated for call it 10 or, or 12 years or whatever. And from a maintenance standpoint, I mean, it, it's by far, you know, the most expensive aspect of hanging on to this vehicle is because you're not just doing preventative maintenance anymore. I mean, you're rebuilding transmissions, you're rebuilding engines at times. I mean, it's amazing how many times we see that when we, you know, for, for lack of a better word, lift up the hood and look at some of our partner's maintenance costs. Um, but all in all, all we're saying is here, in here is that whether you're on the left side of this graph or the right side of the graph, it costs about the same. It's just made up of different expenses. All of those expenses have to be managed in order to have this plan work. And right where those lines intersect is what we constantly look for, which is the lowest total cost of ownership to operate that vehicle. And it's also the most reliable way and the safest way to operate that vehicle because you, know, you don't have a bunch of units on the road that are a risk to the operating plan of the municipality because they could go down at any time. So the way that we do that um, is we do an analysis, and this is an ongoing analysis that our people provide. But what this allows us to do is look at the holding period of, of, of this particular vehicle. Again, the reason we chose is it did have the lowest total cost of ownership. And this is a sample analysis that we put together for one of our municipal partners that shows the difference between holding that vehicle for 12 months, for 36 months, or for 60 months. Um, and and we, we can also show anything in between, but you'll see it as we, as we look through the invoice cost of the vehicle, um, the produce book value, we look at the maintenance, and we look at the fuel cost, and we put it all together. The cheapest way to operate this vehicle based on their mileage pattern is on a three-year hold or a 36-month hold of that vehicle. So now that we know that we should only be in that vehicle for a maximum of three years, well, the question comes, you know, how do we fund it? And this is where I think we start to, uh, it starts to make the most sense from a capital uh, budgeting standpoint is that we use a really interesting mechanism. It's called an open-ended or an equity lease. And an equity lease uh, basically gives you all of the benefits of owning a vehicle without having to, to, to pay or finance the whole vehicle um, at once. Um, it's a separate line of credit for our partners and it's designed really to optimize cash flow while still having the flexibility to be able to get out of a vehicle whenever you want. Um, using this template, there's no mileage restrictions. There's no you know, wear and tear provisions that, can, that come on vehicles because really the used car market is determining the value at end of term. 
So if we know that we're going to hang on to this, this vehicle for three years, we really got two options. First option is an open-ended lease, which essentially, um, you know, we're building equity in that vehicle as, as, as time goes on. Over three years, we're building $11,875 of equity in the vehicle. That's with the RBV being just over $6,000 and the purchase price, again, just being over $25,000 as opposed to self-funding that vehicle, which you're basically writing a check for 25,000 bucks and then three years you get 18 back. Which really all you did was you tied up $25,000 for three years that could have been used elsewhere. So again, by using this mechanism, it allows our partners to replace more vehicles faster and start to reduce the operating expenses of the older vehicles in order to save more money. And what we typically show our partners uh, is an analysis like this that allows us to show how that would scale uh, from a cash in cash out perspective, moving away from purchasing vehicles um, as part of your CapEx budget and moving on to an equity leasing model. This is um, a real live example for one of our partners. Um, and, and what this will show is, is basically the impact projecting out over the next six years of replacing vehicles. So if you look at this fleet today, there are 37 vehicle fleet their current cycle is, is 7.4, which means they're replacing, you know, just over seven vehicles per year. Um, the current maintenance cost per month for them is $78, and that's their data. The annual mileage or kilometers driven, just over 16,000 kilometers per year. And we also have um, their estimated fuel uh, based on their liter per 100 kilometer analysis at 18.8. And you'll see the line highlighted in orange in the middle of the screen just represents the current fleet plan today. So in their CapEx, they were approved for five vehicle purchases per year, um, which means that they have a capital outlay of $140,000 to acquire new vehicles. And when they have that capital outlay for $140,000, their maintenance costs is, is not only just on the remaining old vehicles, but also on the five new that they bring in every single year which puts their maintenance cost, and again, this is their number, $34,632 per year, and their fuel expense at just over 130 grand, which means their entire fleet budget is $303,000 uh, for the course of the year, and that's writing a check for five vehicles every single year. And what we looked at was a replacement strategy to replace all of the vehicles over six years that are in the fleet, and what that would look like from a cash, uh, cash flow standpoint. So in the first year, you'll see in 2019, we're replacing 14 vehicles on our program rather than five. And they're still going to own 23 vehicles outright. And you'll see the buckets kind of shift a little bit here initially in terms of, of maintenance and fuel. And you'll see a reduction in the fuel cost. You'll see a reduction in the, the maintenance cost. But you'll also see a reduction in cash flow because they have the, the cash going out now have $118,000 in lease payments, uh, which their net cash position actually improved by $133,000 in year one. And then I'm not gonna go through this whole thing just in the, for the sense of time, but essentially over the six year hold of operating this way, the cash savings back into the municipality is $437,000 over the course of six years. Um, and keep in mind that, you know, that that's money that you can put elsewhere now, which is really important to a lot of the municipal partners we have. And a couple other pieces that, that come with this is, you know, we talk a lot about maintenance with our partners in terms of how they manage maintenance today. And, you know, one of the things that this municipality, they had an internal shop, they had six mechanics that worked out of that location um, and they, re they repaired all of their vehicles on, on site there. One of the analysis that we put together was, was we actually looked repair RO by RO to see what it cost them to do the basic preventative maintenance on these work trucks and it was costing them about a third more to do an oil change on a truck than it did for us to do it um, outsource at another vendor. And, and that's important because internal shops make a ton of sense when you have a lot of equipment that's mandatory to have, whether it's, you know, mowers or snow plows or excavators or backhoes or whatever it is. But for light duty vehicles, it can be a consistent challenge that we see first off because of technology, the technology in order to run diagnostics and do these basic preventative maintenance repairs on these new vehicles is getting more and more intense from the manufacturers and to keep up with the technology you need to be able to keep these vehicles safe and keep the right maintenance done on them is becoming very expensive to have that on site. You know, the second piece of that is you have to stock all the parts and supply all the parts. 
Well, the hard part is that if, if you have multiple manufacturers in your fleet, while well, you're carrying, you know, air filters and radiators and all sorts of parts for vehicles from different model years from different manufacturers, and it can become incredibly cumbersome to have to manage all of that internally for mechanics. So long and story short is not only were we able to show hard dollar savings of $437,000, but what we ended up doing was building a plan to help phase light duty vehicles out of their internal shop over the next six years as some of their mechanics started to retire, which will also have a huge savings from a labor standpoint, as well as just all the operating costs to keep a shop up and running. So there, there's some other benefits outside of just the cost savings from, from our initial program of helping them buy, sell, and maintain vehicles. But on our, on our maintenance program that we offer, it's also a fixed and budgeted program that allows them to flatten their maintenance costs and go to any shop that they want to use um, to repair those vehicles moving forward, having enterprise manage all of the service intervals and handle all the payables and authorizations. So they're completely out of the maintenance business altogether on light duty vehicles. So there's just a ton of, of um, help that we can provide in areas outside of just the acquisition, the you know, monitoring and tracking, the resale of vehicles. It's also things like maintenance and fuel management and telematics and reporting and technology and kind of all that stuff. So I thought that would be an interesting analysis to share. So, so after we, we, we share this with our customers and we build that plan and we're, we're, we're managing that plan and we hold ourselves accountable for the cost, at the end of every year, we actually sit down with our municipal partners and your account management team provides an annual client review where we review the financial impact of the fleet over the course of the year. And it allows us to see, you know, it's kind of a scoreboard for us to see kind of how we did um, over our first year, second year, third year of managing the fleet together. But more importantly, it allows us to, to tweak and make adjustments to the plan as we start to recognize um, opportunities within the fleet because Again, you have someone who's going through the fleet with a fine tooth comb every single year to figure out if there's opportunities, you know, and a great example of one that we've done recently is a municipality out west that we're working with where we were able to take 25% of their vehicles out of running half tons into quarter ton vehicles. So that's, you know, might not seem like a big change, but going from a half ton, call it a 1500 work truck into like a Chevy Colorado or a Ford Ranger, it's about a 20% reduction in total cost of ownership from a fuel maintenance acquisition and, and, and resale standpoint. It's also less capital intensive to operate those vehicles rather than a heavier vehicle. So there's just all sorts of ways that we continue to provide reinforcement based on our knowledge and expertise that comes into managing these vehicles. I know there's gonna be some questions at the end and we wanted to leave some time for that, but I thought I'd just throw this up and we'll shoot this out to everybody after, but this is um, a, um, a, a case study or, or a quote from Cardston County CFO, um, who's one of our, our municipal partners out West in Alberta. And this just talks a little bit about um, our impact that we've had with them over the, the, the two years we've been working with them now. Um, you can see, I think I bolded the, what I, what I thought was the most valuable part here was all told we were saying approximately 50,000 to 80,000 savings per year from the way the fleet was managed uh, or formerly managed and we get 20 new vehicles every year. And I, I think that just, just speaks to, you know, what we can do for our folks when we, when we have the right partners in place and we're working with the right people on the team. So with that being said, um, we can open up with some questions now. Um, if anyone, I think I saw a couple pop up there um, in the q and I'm gonna just pop this open really quickly. Um, I don't know, Tanner, if you wanna to hop in. Sure, yeah, I'll read these ones out and then if uh, you guys wanna answer them. So the first one uh, came in, what happens with outfitting of the vehicle? Do you move the components over to the new vehicle at no extra cost? Depends on what the entity wants to do. We, we outsource uh, aftermarket to local vendors, so local tax base, and we've got existing partnerships all over, all over Canada, really. There's typically a cost to move that. Now, an entity might want to do that in-house in their own shop, and that's fine if that is a more cost-effective option, if they would like us to leverage our 
resources and help facilitate that process, whatever that third party charges to do that uh, is what they charge. And we just pass through whatever that cost is, we pass that back through to the, the entity. All right, so the next question is, does the model still work for high mileage vehicles, uh, for example, those doing 50 to 100,000 kilometers per year? Yeah, typically, actually, uh, there's aspects of it that work better. The benefit of having really low mile units is they're worth a ton of money on the back end. The reason why it works with higher mileage uh, units is because your operating costs are going to start skyrocketing if you're doing 100,000 kilometers a year. And it becomes it becomes very difficult to manage. The numbers are a little bit different, but the uh, the idea of the three lines crossing is still the same. All right. So the next question is: Does the model include one hundred percent externally managed maintenance and repairs? What about seasonal tire changes, added equipment like GPS radios, light packages, bed mount hoists, etc.? So we talk through that, you know, as we get, the, the typical process is we'd meet with an entity, we'd understand some of, you know, just some of the key priorities that they're going and take the fleet out of it for a second, just how they are approaching budgeting. And then we put together, uh, after collecting a little bit of data, we put together sort of a first stab at proof of concept. And we can do that a bunch of different ways. The more complex the aftermarket, the more we just need to talk through what that proof of concept looks like. Sometimes if the entity wants to include that in there, we can do that. Other times, let's say somebody has 100 vehicles and 60 of them are very you know, light aftermarket. You know, maybe they logo them up, maybe they put a toolbox in the back, maybe a, a tonneau cover or shell, just light stuff like that. We build our model off those 60. And then we can approach the other 40 units that have light bars and, you know, drilling holes in the roof and uh, maybe police cruisers, stuff like pursuit vehicles. We can approach that separately to simplify the process. But let's get past the proof of concept first. Uh, sometimes municipal entities want to handle aspects of that themselves. And again, sometimes they want us to outsource that through our current vendors. And we can do that as well. So we can we can build those types of costs in. Uh, typically, we'd say let's do that farther down the line after we've proven that this concept makes sense for your entity. All right. We do all, kind, we do all kinds of aftermarket work with our clients if they want our help with it. If they want to do it in house, they can. You have every right to do it in house. Okay. So next one is, uh, will you be making recommendations, for example, for electric vehicles, taking into consideration the climate emergency and green fleet strategy? Totally up to the individual entity. So if that is a high priority for an entity, then we would absolutely take that into account. Uh, to, in today's market, just from a pure dollars and cents standpoint, there's not a lot of return on investment by going all electric if you just looked at the dollars and cents, but we have plenty of clients where it's way more than just the dollars and cents. Or perhaps, you know, even from a commercial side of the business, they're, you know, a, a, a wind development uh, or wind energy type of company may be far more focused on some of the green impact than what the dollars and cents costs are. So that's part of our initial conversation is what are you trying to accomplish? Let's talk through some of that kind of stuff so that we can propose something that's in line with your key objectives. And then once let's, let's say that is the case that, uh, that uh, green is the way to go, then let's find the, let's find the best solution for that entity based on what's going on in the market today. All right, so as a quick one, what's the largest municipality using your program? Uh, I don't know offhand, and I guess it depends on what you're looking at. If it's by, like, I believe the city of Chicago is a client of ours. That's probably the largest uh, big name down in the States. Um, but sometimes an entity can have more vehicles because they're more dispersed, but it's not as dense population wise. So I guess it depends on what you're looking at. Okay, uh, do you mind sending a slide deck out so we can present the concepts to senior management? 
Yeah, no problem. We can definitely shoot it over and have Tanner send that out to everybody. Yep, you bet. I'll be sending out an email in the next day or two with uh, the information and the link to the video as well. Uh, question, are the fuel savings calculated due to the models being newer and offering greater fuel economy? That is correct. I mean, I mean, our analysis takes into consideration two things. The first one is degradation based on the older vehicles. The second one is the new fuel technology, the newer vehicles coming in as a calculation based off the Canadian national average pump price. Or we can incorporate a lot of our municipal uh, clients have on-site fuel. So if there's a particular dollar amount per liter, it'd be the same whether, I mean, continue to use your own system. Uh, you just, we, Tell us what you pay per liter and we can build that into our model. Okay. Uh, what is the size of fleet that uh, makes the best starting point? How many vehicles? Uh, typically we find, we, we target clients that have a minimum of 25 vehicles that I would say are in our core niche. So we can do everything up to uh, we can do we can do basically everything up to like an F seven fifty even some international type of stuff. We we don't do things like street sweepers and and high specialty units, but service bodies, dump bodies, that kind of stuff uh, go there. But where this model works the best is on uh, where it works the best is one ton and below. I would say. Okay. Uh, how do you work with municipalities that have vehicles purchased through the capital budget, but a lease would need to go through the operating budget and thus create a tax increase? Can we capitalize the lease together? If we have an addendum to our master agreement that allows, like, we don't care how you put it on your books. Uh, that's up to interpretation, but we do have language in our agreements that allows you to treat it one way or another. Okay, uh, the, the person who asked that was anonymous, but feel free to um, just contact myself directly if you wanna keep that conversation going a little bit further to work out those, uh, those questions. Uh, the next one, are there any programs available for fire truck purchases? So I'll let you guys answer that first and then I've got an answer as well. If we're talking about like the, the big fire truck with ladders and hoses and that kind of stuff. We haven't gotten into that yet. We do, however, do like if it was like Tahoes and Yukons and emergency vehicles, we do do those. Okay, so as part of the LAS group buying program, we have a, a capital purchasing program where we've got agreements with manufacturers from five different uh, fire truck manufacturers. So that includes Rosenbauer, Maxi Metal, Pierce, E1, and Spartan. So if that's uh, something that you've got on the books going forward, let me know and we can work with you to, to get some better pricing on those purchases. Uh, next, how long would we be without a vehicle when it is to be serviced? Do we need to deliver and pick up the vehicle? And where would be the nearest place for serving or uh, for servicing be to us in Walkerton? So we outsourced we outsource to a local tax base and we have a series of preferred vendors uh, and David can send out a link on our website that allows you to put in your postal code and it'll show you all those preferred vendors in the area. I guess it would depend on uh, what their what their current backlog looks like in their shop. The nice thing is, is the majority of the repairs that would be done on newer units is so minimal that the majority of the time you, you pop into a, you know, a Mr. Lube type of place in, out, in, out and done. We also have, if you have assigned vehicles, we have a mobile application that's free, but we can, uh, there are certain vendors out there and we're, we're continuing to grow this and, and maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse in Canada. I apologize, I moved from the US a few months back you were able to book appointments proactively via the mobile app. We're working on that. And I don't know the number of vendors in Canada yet, but we tend to find uh, there are quite a few vendors that are already partners of ours all over. In the event we don't have a good uh, base of partners in the area you operate, we can work with our national service team to establish some of those. 
All right, so how does program work with insurance? What happens if a vehicle is involved in a major, minor or major accident? Uh, no, probably no different than what you do today. Mo I don't know, here in Canada, I guess maybe you can answer, are most entities self-insured for comp and collision? Uh, most municipalities will have insurance for covering that. I don't think too many self-insure. Got it. Uh, it it worked the same. We're listed as a uh, we're listed as I guess the uh, additional payee, additional loss payee, and so once the insurance company settled on the unit and the check is cut, no different than today. If the insurance company decides that you know the vehicle should be repaired, you do the same things that you do today. Yeah, essentially there'd be no difference to your insurance policy as it stands that you're operating right now. I mean, from third party liability perspective, as well as collision and comprehensive, that would all stay standard. Typically what we see with premiums as you know, the fleet starts to get refreshed and the average model year of the vehicles um, increases, that your vehicles are newer, typically we see ins insurance premiums uh, head down for most of our municipal partners at that standpoint based on being in newer vehicles with newer safety options um, and, and, and you know. Okay, so that's the end of the, the questions that we have typed in here. We can stick around for a couple more minutes just to see if any others pop up. Um, but uh, David and Alex, thanks for presenting. Do you have anything else you wanted to say before we wrap things up? Okay, just one last comment. In our experience, you know, the way that these conversations are most successful is if senior leadership is involved from the get-go. It's a big cultural shift. Uh, it, you know, it, it usually involves several different departments within an entity. And for the proof of concept and the process and how would we go about this and what information can we provide, it's really important that we have uh, top executives as part of the process from the get-go. We just find if we try to work backwards, uh, it becomes very challenging and sometimes, you know, together who we're working with, we miss some of the key priorities of a municipality and we spend a lot of time, but we, we should have done something different. So David's information is uh, part of this, this packet. We'd love to meet with as many municipalities as possible to understand some of the key priorities and how we might be able to help. We just ask that we have involvement from the top. Uh, and, uh, you know, we do all of this stuff free of charge. So there's really no downside to, to taking a meeting and seeing what we can do. Okay. All right. We've had a couple more questions come in. Uh, in the last minute or so. So does this program make any sense for an 11 unit fleet? Now we our our starting point is really 25 or more vehicles. Okay. And then do you have a heavy equipment side of things? I guess it depends on, probably not, although it depends on what you consider heavy equipment. That's another one uh, that's part of the same capital purchasing program through LAS that the fire trucks uh, are. So we've got quite a list there, Case, John Deere, Volvo, uh, Cat, New Holland, uh, that you can use to access that kind of equipment through the LAS program as well. So again, if you have questions on that one, let me know. All right, and I think we will wrap it up there. I don't see any further questions. So thanks everybody for joining today uh, and we'll look forward to working with you in the future. Yeah, thanks guys. We're really excited. Thanks for everyone who made it out. We appreciate it. Thank you all.